One second. Good morning, Bible Fellowship. I am going to move this back because I definitely am going to hit it if I don't. (laughs) I talk with my hands, as you all know. If you have your Bible with you this morning, you can go to 1 Timothy. We're in the book of 1 Timothy again. Uh, Chapter 6. And it's kind of a thematic message to the holiday that we are experiencing this weekend. So, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, we'll read verses 17 to 19, which says the following. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they, make, that they may take hold of that which is truly life. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be here and to be able to gather together and study your word and worship you in song and fellowship together. Lord, I pray that as we study this passage, you would highlight its truth to us, give us grateful hearts, so that we may glorify and magnify you as you richly deserve. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're in the grade six, seven, eight Sunday school class, you can be dismissed to your classroom. Thanks for hanging around with us this morning. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, You guys are really quiet all of a sudden. What happened? We were singing great five minutes ago, and all of a sudden the room just... I have these jokes that come to mind, and I'm so glad sometimes that they don't make it through the filter, you know? (laughs) Anyways, I'm grateful that you're here this morning, and uh, we're going to talk today about enjoying God's riches. Enjoying God's riches. And we are living in a culture in a time of abundance. And the Bible has a lot to say about abundance, about prosperity, about riches, about wealth, all of these things. And when I use those terms today, I am speaking very broadly. Don't automatically just assume we're talking about money per se. That's part of our prosperity or wealth as people. But wealth, prosperity, God's blessing in our lives comes in many different forms, far beyond just wealth. It comes also in the form of our physical health, our relationships, our needs being met, our satisfaction at the soul level. And in Christian circles, we have different ways of thinking about this topic. So I thought I would start off by just simply highlighting what I think are two opposite extremes on how to think about this issue, and I want us to avoid falling into both of them because I think they're both mistakes. The first way to think about wealth is what we sometimes call in uh, theological terms the prosperity gospel or prosperity theology. This is a kind of teaching that exists in some corners of the Christian church and in the Christian world, which essentially says that if you're a good Christian, if you do the things that God wants you to do and have really strong faith, he will bless you and meet all of your needs take away all of the problems in your life, and you're just going to live this carefree existence. That's prosperity theology. The Bible does not teach that, although some pastors, I put that in quotations, have used this teaching to make themselves rather wealthy at the expense of other people. Now, that's wrong, okay? We do not believe that God is going to guarantee or promise us that he will make us rich, make us perfectly healthy, heal all of our relationships, and fix every single problem in this life. We don't believe that because the Bible doesn't teach that. But then there's a second error we can fall into, which is on the opposite end, which is what sometimes is called poverty theology. The idea of poverty theology is it's kind of the exact opposite, which is if you're really a good Christian, then you'll suffer. You'll always be in misery and under hardship and persecution and you're going to give away all your money so you've got no food and no clothes and that's what a really godly christian would do they would not put any value in material things and they would just suffer for the lord and be happy about it know what i'm saying (laughs) poverty theology that's really not true either both of those are errors that we should avoid and we should instead come under a biblical understanding of wealth and prosperity for example 
In Scripture, we see a variety, a spectrum of people in terms of their wealth and prosperity. And among that spectrum of people, you see some of them are godly and some of them are ungodly in every category. Let me give you some examples. There are, in Scripture, godly, rich people. They're rich and godly. Some of the ones that come to mind, for example, is Abraham. God blessed Abraham with abundance, and he multiplied his flocks, and he grew his family huge so that he took over whole lands. And that was God's blessing on Abraham. And Abraham was a faithful follower of the Lord, even though he, of course, was a sinner like the rest of us. He had his ups and downs, but he was a godly man. Think of Job. Job was incredibly wealthy, both at the beginning of the book of Job and again at the end of the book of Job. In the middle, he suffered a lot, we know. But Job was a godly person who God rich, blessed with material things. Also, there's Solomon. Again, Solomon, not perfect. We know he had his ups and downs as a king. But Solomon was a follower of the Lord. And God blessed him with material riches beyond probably what anybody's ever experienced up to that point in history and for a long time after. Into the New Testament, there's a bunch of examples we could mention. One that comes to mind is a little-known figure called Joseph of Arimathea. If you remember, Joseph of Arimathea is the person who donated his tomb to Jesus to be buried. Joseph was a wealthy man, and he had the means by which to pay for and give away his own burial plot to Christ, who, by the way, only borrowed it for a little while. So you see, there are godly rich people. There's also ungodly rich people. The one that comes to my mind is in Mark chapter 10. There's the rich young ruler who has a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus, in that conversation, exposes that this guy is in love with his money. And he walks away from following Jesus and decides not to become a disciple because he loved his money more than he loved Christ. That's ungodly rich. So along the spectrum of riches, you've got ungodly and godly people in the rich category. How about in the poor category? There are godly poor people in the Bible. Lots of them. I could give tons of examples. I'll just mention one. In the New Testament, there is a time where Jesus is at the temple and he's watching people going forward, putting their offering into the box. And he sees in that a widow who goes forward, who's totally poor, and puts in her last two coins. And Jesus praises her for her sacrifice and act of faith. This is somebody who's poor and godly. God has, uh, you know, bestowed upon her salvation, but not necessarily material blessings. On the other hand, there are also poor who are ungodly. The most prominent example I can think of is in the book of Proverbs. There's this repeated reference to a person called the sluggard. If you've ever read Proverbs, you're like, oh, I remember those ones. The sluggard is lazy. The sluggard is hungry and poor, not because they're ungodly, just because they won't do anything. They're lazy. They don't want to get out of bed. They don't want to go to work. They don't want to get a job. They don't want to get up and harvest. And that is an ungodly way to live, and it's led them to poverty. The point I'm trying to make simply is this. There's a broad spectrum in the Bible of both rich and poor and all things in between, and that really has nothing necessarily to do with the state of your godly or ungodliness necessarily. It's not really about how much or how little you have, but what place it holds in your heart. Because you can be poor and love money. You can be rich and love the Lord way more than your wealth. There's all kinds of ways to look at this. One of the things that's great is in James chapter 2, you see that James is talking about the gathered church, and in the gathered church, there's both rich and poor. Now, James warns that church, be careful not to play favorites. Don't start catering to the rich because they're wealthy and giving them the seats of honor at the expense of the poor. But what you see is within the gathered church, there's rich and poor. That's a Christian expression of a church. So I hope and expect that within within the walls here of Bible Fellowship and within our community of congregation, there's a spectrum of people who have lots and people who have little. And that doesn't necessarily reflect whether or not you're a godly or ungodly person. So, we need to come to this text with that in mind. I also want to get you to appreciate for a moment that you might be richer than you think. 
See, this passage in 1 Timothy began with the phrase, as for the rich in this present age. And then he goes on to charge them with commands. And some of us might think, well, I hope they're listening. (laughs) I hope the rich people are listening because that definitely doesn't apply to me. Well, maybe it does. Think about this. If you have a home to live in, you're doing pretty well. If you own a closet full of clothes, more than one change of clothes, I think you're doing pretty well. If you have access to modern medicine, then you're doing pretty well. If you own more than one pair of shoes, then you're doing better than a lot of other people. If you have indoor plumbing in your house, and you lift a tap and out comes hot or cold water, depending on which way you turn the nozzle, then you're doing pretty well. If you have a cell phone and have access to all kinds of technology that you carry around with you in your pocket, then you're doing pretty well. If you earn more than a dollar a day, then you are doing better than literally billions of other people on this planet. Here's the thing. We don't feel rich when we compare ourselves sometimes to our neighbors here in Canada. But if we compare ourselves to the global population, we are living in extreme abundance. All of us are. That's just the reality. You're richer than you think, and so I just want to make the argument that this text applies to you. Don't just assume, well, I'm not that rich. I'm struggling to get by. You're doing better than a lot of other people are by a long shot. In fact, uh, this week I went on some different websites, and it was sort of this algorithm that would take how much of the money you earn in a year based on what country you live in, and it would feed it through this program and kind of spit out on the other side how well you're doing compared to other parts of the world. And so as I uh, tested out some of these calculators, I found they gave me different results, so I decided not to quote them because I wasn't really sure exactly which one was the most accurate. I don't know how to figure those things out. But the thing that was consistent among all the ones that I found is that compared to the global population, I'm doing fantastic. And I think I'm just a pretty average, ordinary person. And so most of us here, compared to what other people are dealing with in the world, we are living in unbelievable abundance. In fact, somebody challenged me this summer to think about my phone in a different way that has really, I haven't stopped thinking about it. They made the argument that technology is wealth. And here's how they made that argument. They said, if you send, let's say, 10 text messages in one day to 10 different people, the only way you could have ever done that living 500 years ago is if you were a king. Because that would have required you to have 10 messengers at your disposal to take your written message out to deliver to those people. How many of us have 10 people working for us? Anybody? A few of you, maybe. Those of you who have some big businesses, God bless you. Most of us don't have anywhere near that kind of... We think, I got to do everything myself. Mm, Technology has changed that big time. If you have a phone in your pocket, it is as if you have hundreds of servants at your disposable at all times throughout the whole day. You can send one to the bank by doing your online banking. You can send a message over here. You can access information that years ago would have been incredibly hard to access. You'd have to track down an expert and hire them and come bring them home to teach you. Instead, you've got YouTube and all kinds of places you can go for unbelievable amounts of information. Our technology is wealth. That really transformed my thinking to think, wow, I do not use my wealth (laughs) the way that I should. I don't use my technology the way that I should. I'm wasting opportunity. My big idea is that I want you to think that this passage applies to you, that you're doing better than you realize. In the grand scheme of things, God has been incredibly good to all of us. I think the vast majority of us focus on the one or two or three things in our life that are not going the way we want to, and we overlook the thousand things that work every single day. That's how we live our lives. A thousand things have already gone right for you this morning just to get you here. And yet we're thinking in our minds about the one or two things that that aren't lining up to our expectations. God has been so good to us, and yet we are often so miserably ungrateful. So this text applies to us. Therefore, let's come under the authority and learn, right? Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to have a four-point sermon. Here's what we'll look at in the text. The text gives us two dangers for the wealthy to avoid and two duties for the wealthy to execute. 
So let's look at them one at a time. Danger number one for those of us who are wealthy, which is all of us, is this. Do not become arrogant. Here's how it said it in the passage. 1 Timothy 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty. Haughty is another word for arrogant or proud. There is a temptation to think of ourselves as better than other people who are not doing as well as we are. The way that usually comes about, I think, is something like, well, they should have made better choices. They should have made the kinds of choices that I made. Those people were irresponsible with their opportunities. They were irresponsible with their money. They were lazy. They didn't work as hard. They didn't grind the way I have in my life. And everything I've got, I've earned it. And those people who have less than me, it's their own fault. That can be the way we sometimes think. That's exactly what he is saying Don't think like that. Here's why. Let me give you some scriptures to argue why that is a dangerous and sinful way of thinking. 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says this. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Paul's argument here is, you're so arrogant. (laughs) You think that you went out and you earned it. You went out and you got it. And listen, There's a degree of truth in the fact that when we are more responsible, we can set ourselves up better for success. You you reap what you sow. That's true. At the end of the day, though, God is the one who has provided for everything we have. Everything that we have. Literally everything comes from God. If you are in a state of good health, you may think, well, it's because I've made good choices. I've been eating well and exercising, and I try to avoid all those things. At the end of the day, God is keeping you in good health. If your marriage is succeeding, at the end of the day, it's not because you've been a fantastic wife or husband. It's because God has given you grace to humble yourselves and be a selfless person. If your children have turned out well, be careful not to think, well, I really know how to parent my kids. God has been gracious to you. If you have anything in life worth celebrating at all, you should give thanks to God for it. Here's another passage. Deuteronomy 8, 17, verse 18 says this, Beware, watch out, lest you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. Instead, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. God gave you all of the resources you have. God has given you all of the opportunities you've ever had to be successful in life. And yeah, it's true. You probably need to apply yourself in those areas. You need to be responsible, a responsible steward of what God's given you. I'm not denying that. At the end of the day, give glory to God. There is absolutely no reason why we're not laying sick in a hospital bed right now other than God's grace. If you had the ability to get up today and get moving and doing stuff and accomplishing things, that's God's grace on your life. God has given you that ability. He has given you the mental ability to make good choices, the physical ability to work and move. He's given you the humility that you need from the power of His Holy Spirit working in your life to succeed at anything. Anything that we have succeeded at in life or been blessed with is a gift from God. Here's really the big idea. There's two ways to live your life. The first is to say, I deserve what I have. The other is to say, I'm grateful for what I've been given. Two completely different perspectives. Two people living in the exact same circumstances can take two completely different approaches to how they see their lives. One of them is going to lead to boastful pride. I did it. I deserve it. The other is going to lead you to Humble thankfulness. Thank you, God. You've been way better to me than I deserve. Two completely different ways to live your life. So friends, if you have anything in your life worthy of giving thanks to God for, give thanks to him. Don't take the credit. He has been good to you. He has been good to all of us. So much better than we really deserve. Often so much better than we even realize. That was the first danger. Arrogance or pride. Danger number two is this. Do not put your hope in temporary things. Here's how this passage said it. Again, 1 Timothy 6, 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Boy, there can really be a temptation 
can't there be, to put our hope in the things of this world? I mean, just finish the sentence, right? If I could just fill in the blank, right? If I could just get that promotion, things would go right. If I could just change my spouse, our marriage would resolve. If I could just eke out a little more money, things would go right. If I could just get the right political party into power, all this would go away. We just have this silly way of thinking that changing things in the material world is really what's going to fix things. Of course it's not. Riches, this passage says, are uncertain. They're here one day and gone the next. We often think about things like retirement savings or different ways we can lay up these treasures for the future, and we think of them as security and safety nets and things like that. And listen, those things can get pulled out from under you at any second. And if they don't, that's God's grace. God's been good to us. But we put our hope in Him, not in the uncertainty of temporary things. Material blessings are temporary. They're here one day and gone the next. And they're uncertain. You never know when it's going to go away. Conversely, God is eternal from beginning to end. No changing. And God never fails. He follows through on every single promise. We've got to be real careful about where we're putting our hope. Again, this may mean you can have incredible abundance. Just don't put your hope in it. Put your hope in God. That's a hard thing to do when you're wealthy. Here's what Proverbs 11:28 says. Whoever trusts in his riches will fall but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. All our green leaves are turning different colors now, but we understand what this is like. When spring comes and the buds start to bloom and everything comes back to life, those of us who put our hope in the Lord will flourish like that. But if you put your hope in the material things of this world, you will fall. That's what Proverbs says. Here's another passage to consider. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What a passage. Again, this is saying not to keep your life free from any money or material blessing at all. It's not what it says. Keep your life free from the love of these things. This is really about where our heart is not how much we have. All of us have more than we deserve, but are you putting your hope or trust in that? Is your heart trusting in the Lord or is it trusting in the circumstances you feel like you've built around you? It says, keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Man, that is one of the hardest passages to obey in all the Bible, isn't it? Or is it just me? (laughs) I hope it's not just me. Because I think to myself, I have so much more than I deserve, and yet I constantly struggle with grumbling and being a complainer and feeling like, yeah, this is good, but I could do a little better. Yeah, this is nice, but I know there's that other thing out there that would be a little more satisfying to me. As if once you get there, you'll arrive. The truth is, if your heart is ungrateful, it does not matter how much you have, you'll never appreciate it. Once you get to where you thought, would make you happy and you arrive there, suddenly you realize it's the next thing out that you really need and the next thing and the next thing and you're constantly chasing an empty dream. Be content with what you have. God has given us so much more than we appreciate. What does this passage say? Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. And what's the key to making that happen? Remember that God has said to you, I will never leave you or forsake you. The key to being content in this world, whether you have a lot or a little, comes down to appreciating the role that God's presence plays in your life. If you have God with you, if he says to you, I will never leave you or forsake you, you are rich. You have everything you need. You have more than the richest person on this planet if they don't know the Lord. You're way more wealthy than they are. And yet we don't think like that, do we? If you've got God in your life, you've got everything you need. Never mind material stuff. That comes and goes. The Lord is there forever. His love is never ending. We sang this morning, great is his faithfulness to you. He is faithful. He will never leave you or forsake you. That is the richest blessing you could possibly receive. From God's perspective, 
we don't own anything. It's just loaned out to us, right? Some of us feel like, oh, I finally paid off that house. I finally got that item I wanted. I finally got the job I wanted. I finally got the thing I wanted, and it's mine, right? God says, nope, that belongs to me too. I own everything, in case you didn't know that. But I'm willing to loan that to you for a time. So the key, really, to being content is to live with open hands. God gives, and he takes. That's what Job did. Let's go back to Job for a second. Job 1, 20 and 21 says this. This is after Job has lost all of his flocks, his house, his family, his life has fallen apart. Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, because he's in grief and misery, and he fell on the ground and he worshipped. Wow. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a response is that. What an example to set. I don't know if I could do that. (laughs) That's pretty impressive. Only the Holy Spirit in me could ever give me a heart like that. But Job realizes, even though he had just lost great amounts of wealth, you know what? It was just on loan anyways. It wasn't mine to keep. God lended it to me, and then he decided to take it back. He knows what he's doing. Praise him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a perspective. That would change the outcome of so many situations we are dealing with. Because we always think the situation has to change when really it's usually us. Our attitude in the middle of what we're dealing with is what God's trying to change. That's the thing that matters the most. So those are two dangers to avoid. We need to avoid arrogance, thinking we're better because we made all the right choices. We need to avoid putting our hope in riches. They are temporary. They come and go. Instead, we have, on the other side, two duties to employ. So let's look at the first one. Duty number one is this. Enjoy God's gifts. Maybe you didn't see that one coming. Let's go back to our passage, 1 Timothy 6. This is... uh, the end of that passage, as for the, or the beginning and middle, rather. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. This is why poverty theology, like I mentioned at the beginning, is wrong. Poverty theology says God wants us to get rid of everything, live at the absolute bare minimum, and he really doesn't even want us to be happy. He just wants us to give it all away. Well, this actually says God has richly provided you with everything to enjoy. That's what the Bible says. There's a degree in which many of us struggle with guilt. Because, like I was just mentioning at the beginning of this sermon, when we compare ourselves to other people, yeah, sometimes we look really poor. Oftentimes we look really rich, especially compared to the global population. And then something can happen where we start to feel horribly guilty. And you feel like, oh my gosh, I I probably should give up way more than I have. I probably should sell my house. I probably should just start to, you know, like offload this stuff because I'm clearly way too happy. I'm enjoying this stuff way too much. Well, this verse does say God has given you those things to enjoy. God's provisions are meant to be enjoyed. They're just not meant to be worshipped. There's a difference. You can enjoy something that God gives you without making it an idol. And you can do that with your wealth. You don't have to make it an idol, but you can enjoy it to some degree. Here's what James 1.17 says. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow, do to change. Every good and every perfect gift you have in your life came from God. He doesn't want you to feel guilty about it. You should avoid worshiping it. You should avoid putting your hope in it. But he wants you to enjoy it. It's a gift from him. The things that we have in this life are meant to be enjoyed. If you have good health, you should enjoy that. If you have delicious food to eat, you should enjoy that. If you have clothes that you like, you should enjoy that. If you have a family that's functioning, you should enjoy that. If you have a home that you're blessed with, you should enjoy that. If God has given those things to you, enjoy them. I know that sounds weird, doesn't it? 
Part of us is like, mm, I don't know about this. Let me give you another passage to continue to make this argument. Matthew 7, this is Jesus talking in the Sermon on the Mount, beginning at, beginning at verse 9. Jesus says, Which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, would give him a stone? Well, that wouldn't be very nice. Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? That's not very nice either. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? We have this idea sometimes that God's just grumpy and we should be too. Like he doesn't want us to enjoy things too much. The truth is God has given us many blessings with the intent that we enjoy them. Not that we worship them, but that we enjoy them. They're his gift to us. This passage is literally saying, when a father or a mother, let's say, either one, a parent, gives to their child a gift, Do they want that kid to feel guilty about it for the rest of their life? Or do they want them to enjoy it? I mean, we're coming up on Christmas. All of us who are parents, when we put those toys under the Christmas tree or whatever your tradition is, we're excited for our kids when they open it and they get the thing that they want and their mind blows up, right? We snap some good pictures of their reactions. We love it. And this verse says, don't you think God's like that? God's your father. He loves you. He knows how to give good gifts to his kids, and he wants you to enjoy them. They're his blessings to you. We should enjoy them. I'll give you one more verse in case you're not convinced yet. Ecclesiastes 2, 24 and 25 says, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? God gives us good gifts. I mean, think about the world we live in. Think about how God has designed us to live in this world. It's unbelievable. Earlier, uh, this couple weeks ago, I guess, my son and I hiked up to the top of Robertson Cliffs. It's the first time either one of us had ever done that. And it was amazing. It was just beautiful. You know, we just stayed up there for a bit and enjoyed God's creation and worship it. Gave the glory all to God, but it was like, this is awesome. The fact that we can do this and see this and enjoy his creation. God has woven into his creation so much pleasure and beauty. He did it so we could enjoy it. It's a reflection of him. When you enjoy something, that's God's gift to you. All the different things God has designed for us to enjoy, even just think of food. I mean, we're coming, hopefully, hopefully you've got a nice warm meal ready for you later today or maybe tomorrow, depending on what your routine is for the weekend. And all the different flavors that God has given us. Like, God did not have to give the world flavor, did he? Right? I mean, he just could give us mouths to eat, bland food, because it gets the job done. Instead, he's given us all kinds of variety. When you read Genesis, and God's making all kinds of birds and all kinds of fish and all kinds of plants and all kinds of fruit and vegetables, he's making all kinds of varieties because it's a reflection of his goodness and beauty meant to be enjoyed. He loves us. So we should enjoy it. But let's not forget the next duty because that keeps it in check. Duty number two, not only should we enjoy it, but we should share what God has blessed us with. That's the key too, isn't it? If God has blessed you with material things, anything worth rejoicing in, do what you can to share that with others. Spread the joy. God has not just given it for you to enjoy, but so that you can spread that joy out onto others. Just because God wants us to enjoy his blessings doesn't mean he wants us just to keep them all for ourselves. Out of the overflow of God's love, he blesses us, and then we then overflow in love towards others. So let's go back to our text. Talking about the rich, we'll pick it up at verse 18 and 19. It says that they are to do good. The rich should be doing good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves, as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. What does a good life look like? I mean, we have this kind of 
to steal a phrase from our friends south of the border. We have this American dream of what the good life looks like. You know, it's a beautiful nuclear family with 2.5 children and a dog and a house and a white picket fence and maybe a camp on a lake somewhere and we get a nice vacation in the summer. And We have this picture of what the good life is, but this says the rich should be careful. They need to take hold of that which is truly life. The thing that is truly life is to enjoy God's riches and share them with others. If you've got God's love and faithfulness, if you're experiencing that in your life and you let that spill over into others and spread that joy elsewhere, that's a great life. This life is temporary. Our spiritual life is eternal. In fact, he uses the phrase there, storing up for themselves treasure as a good foundation for the future. He stole that one, didn't he, from Jesus. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 19. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. All this stuff comes and goes. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not wrong to enjoy the blessings God has given you. Not at all. But don't love them. Don't need them. Don't hog them. Don't put your hope in them. Enjoy them and share them with others. Spread that out into the world so that God's abundance may be felt by others. And in so doing, what you're really doing is you're storing up treasure in heaven. So many of us are focused on meeting all the needs we got to meet in the next week, the next month, the next year up into retirement and old age and all that stuff. Hey, plan for the future. I got no issue with that. That's a good idea. But plan for the real future, your eternal home. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven. When we give away what God has blessed us with, we're not giving it away. We're storing it up so that we can all enjoy it on the last day in the presence of the one who gave it all. And we'll give him all the praise. It's going to be great. We often don't live like that. So if God has blessed you, bless others. Spread that away. Give it away just as God has given it to you. Give you one more verse uh, along these lines. Acts 20, verse 35. The Apostle Paul says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard, in this way we must help the weak. So yeah, work hard and then share it with people who need it. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. That's backwards thinking compared to what our world values. Our world values getting, and God values giving. And if you want to live a good life, the good life, what that which is truly life, if you want to live that and experience that, then get your mind out of the getting mode and get it into the giving mode. Sharing that abundance with others is how you truly experience the blessed life. We understand this because God has given us this revelation. Let me close with this. We've talked a lot here about material blessing, how we should view it, what we should do with it, making sure we don't put our hope in it, using it as a way to bless others and enjoy it, enjoy God's goodness. But here's the real key to this whole thing. There's really only one way to truly be rich. 2 Corinthians 8 9 says this, For you know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich in heaven, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. What Christ has done for us is truly rich, is true riches, it's truly life, it's truly the abundant life, it's truly the good life. Not all the stuff. The stuff that you have, it comes and goes. Hold it with open hands. Christ is forever. If you want to experience God's blessing on your life, if you want to experience what you were truly made to experience as a creation of his, then you need Christ in your heart. Christ, though he was rich in heaven, the Son of God, eternal, to be worshipped forever, gave it all up and became a servant. He came down to earth. He lived among us in poverty, among people who didn't appreciate him, who despised him, who ridiculed him, who betrayed him, who ultimately abandoned him and nailed him to a cross. And he did all that. He gave up all his riches and became poor so he could give it away. So he could give away his righteousness and his eternal life to us. He is the greatest giver of all. 
And through Christ living in our hearts, that's how you become rich. That's how you experience abundance and that which is truly life. Bible Fellowship, I'll invite you to stand with me and we'll call forward the worship team. And Paul is going to come forward and lead us in a time of communion.